Uh, also use the chat for general conversation. We'll have a QA and a at the end. If you have a question um, that you don't want to ask yourself, you can put it in the chat and put a Q right in front of it so the moderator can identify them. Um, I would also like to mention an upcoming event also being hosted by uh, the New School Liberal Studies Department, which is the same department that NSP does grew out of. Um, we're going to drop the flyer for it in the chat. It is On Living Land. It's a first of an Afro and Indigenous Futures speaker series that will be happening next Thursday. So we invite you to check it out. And with that, we'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Cool. So uh, I'm extremely excited to introduce Caitlin McShay, who's going to be our speaker for tonight's talk. Uh, Caitlin has an academic background in evolutionary biology and a master's in liberal arts. And in true liberal arts fashion, her work is interdisciplinary as she's the director of Santa Fe's Institute's uh, Interplanetary Project and its associated publication house, the SFI Press. She also hosts the Alien Crash Site podcast, a thoroughly Tarkovskian adventure for the fans of the film um, and the Strugatsky Brothers book, ought to check out. And she's also half the space musing duo Atlantis. Um, tonight, she'll be speaking to us about uh, the relationship between science fictions and myths, or more broadly, cultural artifacts, and quote unquote, concrete scientific advancement. Uh, so please give a warm virtual round of applause for Caitlin McShay. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, thank you all for tuning in. I especially want to thank Nick for the invitation to be part of this transceiver series. I am so honored to be included among the speakers and to have the platform to talk to all of you about the really cool intersection of art and science fiction and science itself. Um, and I specifically want to talk about how cool I think that there is a, a school for policy and design for outer space because that focus is so prescient and necessary at this time. So I'm hoping that a bit of my presentation underlines and illuminates why that focus is so great, especially now and as we look to the future. And I'm also hoping that this talk ultimately underscores what the foundational mission of the Interplanetary Project is and how the Interplanetary Project works in service to the science that the Santa Fe Institute performs, because the Santa Fe Institute is primarily, first and foremost, a science research facility, but Interplanetary is the kind of imaginative, exploratory aspect of that institute, and that's what I represent. So I'm going to share my screen, if I may, and go down to PowerPoint. Bear with me. All right, can everybody see Is that great? Looks great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, let me hide me because that's distracting. All right, so uh, this is Interplanetary Poetics. And uh, I, as Peter said, I, I work at the Interplanetary Project uh, Director for the Santa Fe Institute. And I have a lot that I wanna to get to. So I'm going to outline what my goals are and um, hope that I can get to all of them. But if not, maybe we can address them in the Q&A. So space time permitting, I want to focus on how science fiction is the invention of an inspiration for future science. And as Peter underlined in his introduction, this will mean a, descript a descriptive litany of a lot of technological innovations that have been inspired or presaged in science fiction. But I also wanna talk about how science fiction often acts as a simulation engine for social engineering and policy, because that seems more aligned, I think, with the mission of uh, the, po the policy and design for outer space segment of New School. Um, and we'll get to that. It's actually a little more important, I think, than the technology, but all of the examples are cool. I wanna talk about how art is a medium for science accessibility. By this, I mean that there are a lot of very complicated theories at stake in the way that science furthers human understanding of the universe and life's place within it. And science is also a kind of steel walled siloed discipline that's really hard to get into if you're not initiated in its practice. But art is a way of interpreting what science produces and it provides a medium for lay individuals to understand these, these complicated things. This is something that Interplanetary exploits all the time in our festivals and our events. We are constantly referring to science fiction, science fiction film. We are looking at art and music and games as the medium through which science can be understood. I wanna talk about the scientific influence on art because it would be remiss for me to suggest in any way that it's just art to science and not a feedback. Obviously it's not unidirectional. Science influences art all the time and it does a really good job of influencing art. Um, and if I have the time, I want to talk about how art acts as a reconciling medium for science-driven paradigm shifts. 
that is a very crazy sentence. But what I mean by that is um, when a new understanding of how things work emerges, for instance, the Copernican system overthrowing the Ptolemaic system, it can be really viscerally decentering for us humans who exist in the system we thought we understood. You know, oh wait, I, I really, really enjoyed it when I was sitting at the center of the universe and now I'm not, that's very confusing. What does that mean? Um, how does that change the way that I understand my position in the universe? actually my position in the universe. And so art does a really good job of interpreting those post paradigm shifts and um, allowing us to kind of naturally recalibrate to those new understandings and um, to meaningfully explore the consequences of this new understanding. And then I end with a plea for a more imaginative form of scientific exploration. This is a plea from the past and a plea from the future. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna start with technology. Given the fact that I am delivering this lecture via Zoom and not standing at a podium in New York City, which would be much cooler, um, it seems only right that I talk about the uh, envis the envisage uh, in how envisioned the, the the technology for video conferencing uh, existed in 1909. It was actually written. It, it's written all over the place, but I'm going to read from E.M. Forrester as the machine stops. This was you know more than a century ago. An electric bell rang. I suppose I must see who it is, she thought. Who is it, she called. When she listened into the receiver, her white face wrinkled into smiles. She touched the lighting apparatus and the little room was plunged into darkness. It was fully 15 seconds before the round plate that she held in her hands began to glow. A faint blue light shot across it, darkening to purple. And presently she could see the image of her son who lived on the other side of the earth and he could see her. Now this sounds a little more like FaceTime, video phone, but still I think it, it works in terms of this video conference prediction. And um, it's interesting because, you know, given how we've had to adjust our, our working, uh, it's just wonderful that this was predicted and, and invented for our use today. I imagine there are people on the other side of the country watching this right now. This is a consequence of Ian Forrester's imagination. Okay, next, AirPods. Uh, I'm going to read how Ray Bradbury it thought up these tiny little versions of, of hearing devices in 1953. In her ears, the little seashells, the thimble radios tamped tight, and an electronic ocean of sound, of music and talk and music and talk coming in, coming in on the shore of her unsleeping mind. I really love this for two reasons. One, obviously, I love the earbuds exist. They are great. There are some of you who might be using them now. Um, I love the fact that the en envisioning of something like this technological innovation is actually just the consequence of employing an image so simple and mundane as a shell that speakers would essentially be like a shell that one holds up to their ear to hear the ocean. I think that's just absolutely beautiful. But I also love this part about the uh, unsleeping mind, the shore of her unsleeping mind, because in this way, it seems like Brad Bradbury sort of forecast the stimula onslaught that we built for ourselves in the development of our technologies. You know, we have social media and film and television streaming services, radio, music, podcasts, we have Clubhouse now. It's very easy to slip a shell into one's ear, um, just be entertained to no end and thereby not sleep, this kind of technological insomnia. So I just think this is a beautiful example. <laughs> um, this is Hal, you may recognize Hal. Hal is Arthur C. Clarke's and Stanley Kubrick's prediction of the ubiquitous existence of ever learning, always helpful, always obedient, virtual artificially intelligent assistants. Of course, that's a joke, Hal is the worst. But um, it's interesting that we have these Alexas and Google Dots in our house and perhaps we are somewhat cautious about the way that we engage with them by virtue of what we've witnessed in films like 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, ooh, okay, this is my favorite example. So I'm going to take a little bit of time with it. So bear with me. Um, these are etchings by Emile Antoine Bayard. He is a, a French artist who is also responsible for the engravings that were included in the publication of Victor Hugo's Les Mis. Those were much different, right? It's Cosette sweeping and her hair is flying. These super futuristic illustrations were included in the publication of Jules Verne's From Earth to the Moon. And I really like this example because it goes beyond the invention of a technology to the motivation of a huge endeavor, which is traveling to the moon. So this was published in 1865. And in 1865, Jules wrote a story where uh, a gun club 
builds a hollow aluminum bullet-shaped capsule. They shoot it out of a, a moon gun, they call it. It's called the Columbiad. And within this capsule are one, two, three crew members who launch from the shores of Florida, go up to the moon, orbit around the moon a couple of times, and then come back to Earth via a balloon-assisted Pacific Ocean splashdown, where they are safely recovered by the US Navy. 1865. 1968, a century later, we succeed in our Apollo 8 mission, wherein NASA builds a hollow aluminum bullet-shaped capsule, not called the Columbiad, instead the Columbia. And it also contains one, two, three men. They launch from the shores of Florida, they fly to the moon, they orbit around the moon a couple of times, and they return to Earth via a safe, balloon-assisted splashdown in the Pacific Ocean where they are retrieved by the US Navy. It's, it's, it's unbelievable how much Jules got right. And I, I should say that he performed a lot of mathematical calculation to get certain ideas right. And he communicated those ideas with scientists in his network. So there was this kind of scientific exploration, but to imagine in 1865 that we would go to the moon at all that of all of the entities in the world who could do it, it would be the US first, that it would be manned, that it would be three individuals, that it would look like this, launch from here and return there. Exactly. It's, uh, it's just absolutely astonishing. It totally blows my mind. So let's take a moment to admire how awesome that example is and how amazing the story that Vern created actually turned into this very important mission. I think the fact that the capsule is called the Columbia is a nod by NASA to that inspiration. Um, okay, now we move to the Star Trek examples. There are several. And what's cool about these examples is that this points a little more towards the design aspect that I wanna highlight. So it's not so much that science fiction often predicts technological innovation, how devices might work. But once science fiction entered into a visual medium, individuals had to build these items, these props, for characters to use uh, so that the audience can view them using them. And I think that that informs the way that the actual technologies we have look. They're remarkably similar. So this is Captain Kirk. He is holding a communicator. It is a personal communication device, and it looks remarkably like the Motorola flip phone I had when I was a teenager. I think it's interesting to think about how it is that all of the early cell phones, basically until like the Blackberry, were flip phones that seems kind of ridiculous in terms of a design uh, perspective. The flip phone introduces like an unnecessary, inefficient extra thing to make and deal with. Whereas like the open face phone is seemingly more efficient. And of course that's what most of us use today, but it's possible that we built these inefficient flip phones because we were inspired by this design and we work against the limitations of these visual examples all the time when we're thinking about how to invent new items. So that's the communicator. This is the tricorder. Problematically, this isn't a phone. <laughs> like Star Trek missed the opportunity to make the tricorder a communication device. But what it is, is a device that serves a variety of functions because it has all of these different applications that you open in order to perform a particular task. And so in that way, it's sort of like a precursor to the iPhone and all the applications within it or an Android, the application is the, is the invention here. Here, this woman I think is being uh, scanned medically. So, but anyway, you can kind of see the resemblance. This is Captain Picard and his personal access display device, the pad, enough said, I think. Um, and <laughs> here we have a Klingon 3D printing himself dinner. And it's kind of hard to see what he's eating. It looks like a whole boiled crab and a bottle of whiskey. But uh, here, this is the Star Trek replicator. The replicator was used on the ship mostly for the production of food and drink. And of course we have the capacity to print food and drinks now, but um, look at how similar this interface is to the 3D printing machines we're using ubiquitously across the world. I, it's a touch screen for one. It's got a variety of different commands and controls. This printing happens behind the safety of like a glass chemist's hood. It's just astounding how much this resembles the technology that we use today. So this is kind of a, a, a prefactor for 3D printing. Okay, and now I wanna talk about this moment in Star Trek. I certainly don't mean to suggest that Star Trek or science fiction invented the kiss, 
but uh, there's something really important about what's going on in this kiss that will allow me to pivot to the way that science fiction tangibly impacts social change. But before I do that, I think I wanna talk about what the Santa Fe Institute does and what Interplanetary does for the Santa Fe Institute, because then I can explain why this is important to the Interplanetary Project. And I can also explain the power of the counterfactual. So um, I should say that this was aired in 1968. You will see why that's important. Okay, so the Santa Fe Institute is the world headquarters of complexity science, which is to say that we are looking at complex systems. What is a complex system? It is a system that is composed of many individual agents that are behaving and interacting in um, a variety of different ways. They are also adaptive, so it makes things a little trickier. And the way that these individuals behave and interact and adapt manifest at the systems level a sort of emergent phenomenon. These scales exist, or excuse me, these systems exist across all scales. So the way that cells function in the tissues that I have, the way that my organs function in my person, the way that uh, various species of flora and fauna compete and collaborate in an ecosystem, humans and society, culture itself, very big, very small. These are the systems that we're looking at. And what SFI wants to do is see if there are general properties that exist across all of these systems, whether there is a universal law to something like systems or any shared mechanisms. And it's made all the harder, that exploration is made all the harder by the fact that many of these systems are necessarily entangled. So a perturbation over here might have a huge fallout effect on a much larger system over here. <laughs> and that makes trying to predict how these systems behave even more difficult. And I think we, I think, I think we saw a really good example of exactly what I'm talking about in this COVID pandemic. Here we have a seemingly, a practically invisible microscopic element that's arguably not even living, right? Or at least it can't live alone. And it breaks out of a lab, perhaps, or it, it exists in a bat, perhaps. And suddenly, just like that, millions of individuals are sick, millions are dead, millions are uh, psychologically burdened by this huge change that they've had to experience in the last year. We've had to recalibrate the way that we think about work. We've had to recalibrate the way that we think about health systems and distributions. Our economy collapsed, all because of this tiny thing. And here we were operating before COVID under the auspices that all of the systems we occupied were extremely strong. It turns out they're absolutely brittle. So SFI wants to kind of think about that and prevent things like that in the future. So that's what SFI does. Um, we do that by convening meetings with uh, all of the people that we think can contribute their expertise and opinions to very big questions. So this is across all disciplines of science. And the questions that we ask have to be big so that they touch upon all of these different systems. We ask questions like, how does time work? What is life? Why do we die? And in order to figure that out, we ask for the opinion of the computer scientist and the biologist and the physicist and the mathematician and the novelist and the graffiti artist. So the idea is that there is this cognitive diversity that's necessary to be applied towards these problems in order to understand them and to um, elicit new perspectives on these things that we've been thinking about for years and years. So that's what SFI does. Interplanetary takes this a little bit further, um, well, a lot a bit further. Interplanetary is more of an engineering exercise. It's a thought experiment and it presumes a fully functioning, thriving human civilization on planets other than Earth, far, far into the future, like millennia into the future, thousands of years. And what it allows us to do then is to consider how we might engineer robust evolvable systems for society way, way out there without being tethered to the systems we already occupy. So interplanetary provides an imaginative tabula rasa to building human society in the future. This means that I can look at the systems that I have now and break them into their constituent parts and say, I just want this and this. I'm gonna bring these two things to my space colony, but I'm gonna jettison all the rest. Or maybe I just jettison everything and start from scratch and really try to imagine what an ideal human society looks like. What do we think about intelligence when we continue to build machines that help us determine what that is or we imbue them with this intelligence? What do we think of intelligence when we encounter a different species in space that's intelligent? And um, how do we govern or regulate the behaviors of individuals in a totally different future architecture of a city on a icy moon very, very far away from Earth? Is Earth 
still in the mix. How do we engineer communication systems that account for time delays, that account for distance, right? So these are bigger, harder questions, but they get the benefit of a, just an amazing amount of distance from what we already say and do and, and experience. And therefore it allows us to produce possibilities in something I like to call a low stakes simulation engine for humanity. So we can see what a dictatorship might look like in, in 4,000 years on you know, planet B, and we can tease it out to its logical conclusion in art and in imagination or in conversations with diverse individuals. Uh, and we can see, oh wait, that maybe that doesn't work out well, or these elements do, but these don't. And we can learn a little bit about what's possible without actually inflicting any harm on, on the reality of where we are. And furthermore, as we continue to be a little more imaginative about breaking these systems, stepping off of this path to which we're dependent, we can be more proactive in, in inventing a future than the reactive way we necessarily operate here on earth, uh, kind of reacting to the system we occupy and the rules that are already in place and kind of augmenting them here and there. We just get to start from scratch over here. And I think that's really important. So um, essentially what I, what I mean to say about interplanetary, and this is what gets me back to uh, Star Trek, is that when you expand this space time scale to its farthest limits, to an inconceivably large distance and, and space and time, you get the freedom to do things you wouldn't otherwise get to do in reality. And um, we can do that imagination by, again, convening individuals. But instead of convening only scientists and a, and a few renegades that happen to be in our community, now we're inviting individuals who represent all sorts of creative disciplines. This is an image from the very first interplanetary discussion we ever had. And just very briefly, this is a physicist, mathematician, come biologist working on scaling. This is a rocket engineer slash speculative fiction author, astronomer. This is David Krakauer, the president of the Institute. He's also the founder of the Interplanetary Project. This is the kind of pioneering CGI artist. He's responsible, this man is responsible for the liquid cop in Terminator 2. So I love this man. Um, this is an essayist and poet who also was on a, a Mars simulation crew. And this is a, a fine artist who was at the time the artist in residence at SETI. And here we're having a conversation about all of these projects that I, that I mentioned. Um, we also use art and music and media at our festivals to, to further tease out what's possible in the future. So, okay, back to the kiss. What does any of this have to do with the kiss? As I said, this kiss aired in 1968. And in 1968, racial tensions in the United States were extremely high still. It's like technically the end of the civil rights movement because the Fair Housing Act was enacted, but the Fair Housing Act went into law two or three days after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Like things weren't going so well. Um, there's still tension, obviously we haven't fixed it. But in 1967, before this aired, there was a monumental Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia. And many of you probably know about this case, but I'm just gonna outline what's going on so you can see what's so important about what's happening here on your screen. Essentially, the Lovings are an interracial couple and they were arrested in their home and sentenced to spend a year in jail because it was illegal to marry interracially in Virginia. They challenged it, Virginia upheld the decision, they challenged that, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that yes, illegitimizing this marriage based on race alone is unconstitutional. And so the Lovings never had to serve and, and all is well, you would think. But at the time that this aired in 1968, even though the Supreme Court's decision is technically like a federal decision, there were still 16 states in the United States that maintained anti-miscegenation laws in their constitutions. I think Alabama held onto theirs until like 2000. So, um, this was an extremely provocative image to place in front of the eyes of all of the Americans who were still wrestling, wrestling with this racial kind of paradigm shift they were experiencing. And at the time that this episode aired, a Gallup poll was taken and it suggested that 80% or more of Americans think that interracial relationships are unacceptable and inappropriate. So what does it have to do with the counterfactual, et cetera? I just wanna drive home the point that this aired in 1968, but the kiss itself took place in space in the year 2268. And so there's something to be said about what you're able to do in the future away from earth that allows individuals to sort of comfortably begin to challenge their opinions and perspectives. And in that way, you can sort of begin to nudge individuals towards societal progressive change. 
Okay, that was uh, a lot. So thanks for bearing with all of those Star Trek examples. So now that we're talking about societal change, I wanna make a case for where science fiction and speculation have had tangible impact on policy. And that's how I get to the policy part of this aspect of the new school. So um, I'll start with this. This is Robert Heinlein's The Long Watch. It was published in 1949. It's set in 1999. And what happens, what's happening here is that uh, these individuals are working at a nuclear facility that's stationed on the moon. And it's where all of our weapons are stored and produced. Now, what happens, of course, is that some commander gets this idea, hey, wait a second, why am I under the governance of Earth when I control all of the weapons in you know, humanity's creation? I'm going to make Earth seed govern governance to me, give me the power to rule both Earth and the moon. And if they decide not to, then I'm going to start bombing insignificant cities to prove that I'm serious about this. Fortunately, it doesn't happen. Our hero, John, prevents it. But again, this was written in 1949. In 1967, the Outer Space Treaty comes into play. And included in the space, Outer Space Treaty in Article 4 are two specific laws. States shall not place nu nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies or station them in outer space in any other manner. The moon and other celestial bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. These seem explicitly reactive to the imaginative work that Heinlein did in the short story. Um, and I should say that there's a lot of attention being paid these days to the Outer Space Treaty because we're getting closer and closer to having to actually understand what's at stake in these, in these claims, where the, where the lines are drawn. For instance, there is later in a different article, maybe eight or nine, that uh, no state shall damage any other planet in scientific pursuit. Well, how do, we, how do we draw that line? Is mining the moon a damaging thing, perhaps? The, the rovers, they're investigating somewhat peacefully, but they're also shooting lasers up at the surface of Mars. Like, is that acceptable? So this kind of like the constitution, I think is a really interesting living document that we are going to see being changed and, and evolved very frequently in the coming years. And I, I'm curious to see what comes from it. But again, this is 67 and Heinlein was 49. Okay, I have one more example and then I'll switch to the counterfactual in general. So Isaac Asimov in 1942 published a short story called Runaround. And this is where his three rules of robotics first appears. Um, and the first rule is a robot may not injure a human being or through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And so what Asimov is doing here is imagining a sort of ethical best practices for engineering and, and in, engaging in a relationship with machines. Obviously this is hugely important, we are surrounded by machines, but what it leaves out is the, the protections to the machine, it's very human centric. Of course, now that's not the case. We are in conversations frequently about things like robotic rights. And so I'm just gonna give a couple of examples. In 2004, a conference was held about roboethics, wherein the term roboethics was coined. In 2004, also the Fukuoka robot declaration was put into play, was, was ratified in Japan. And um, what that did was essentially create an ethical best practices for individuals who are engineering machines and also more broadly engaging with them. I think more importantly and a little more empathically and beautifully in 2007, South Korea puts out its robotics ethics charter, wherein it says explicitly, this is an expansion of Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. And the thing that is expanded is to ensure that the same protections that humans have as Asimov laid out, um, that those are afforded to the machines in the relationship too. And so it's a much more inclusive, mutual understanding. And then um, I will talk a little bit about this thing on your screen. This is Sophia. You may have seen her in the news. She recently sold an art NFT for $700,000 and she's recording a pop album apparently. But I think most interestingly about Sophia is that in 2017, she was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia. So this machine is afforded in Saudi Arabia the same rights and protections as a human being. It's just d disregard what that might mean for you. It's obviously a pretty controversial ruling or decision, and a lot of people say that it might ultimately harm human rights or devalue them. 
opinions aside, I just want to point to the fact that this is a kind of pivotal moment in human history and specifically this like human machine uh, connection. And it is the direct influence of Asimov who was thinking about this always. It was run around, I robot, the foundation's trilogy. If not for him recognizing the need for something like this, we wouldn't be here. So, okay, so now I'm gonna do my, don't worry science, I love you. Please don't think I, I don't love you, I love you thing. Um, and I wanna talk about how science often influences art. So this image is an image from a short story by Ted Cheng that was published in his most recent collection of short stories, Exhalation. It is called The Merchant and the Alchemist's Gate. And what you're seeing is a man traveling through time with the use of a sort of portal. It's a beautiful story. It takes time travel and it, it marries it to Arabian Nights. And it's not this dystopian, fear-mongering, scary, scary final conclusion science fiction. It's just a lovely piece of literature that teases out something he found fascinating when he attended a lecture by Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne is a Nobel physicist, a Nobel Prize physicist, he's a theoretical physicist. And uh, he gave a lecture about a mechanism through which one could conceivably travel through time, but it involves the use of a portal and it can only be a fixed amount of time. You can't go anywhere. You can just go exactly this amount of time, forwards or backwards. And it involves going through you know, one side of the portal to another. So Ted saw this, he was influenced by it, he was inspired by it, he teased it out, he produced something beautiful. That's excellent. Um, but I wanna relatedly talk about how Kip Thorne frequently consults on really important art projects. He was the lead science consultant on a film called Interstellar, which was written by Jonah Nolan, directed by Christopher Nolan, and whose entire plot centers around relativity, essentially. So that's a big thing to express to a huge audience. This is a blockbuster film. Millions of people were seeing it. And as Jonah Nolan was writing it, he wanted to ensure that he expresses what's at stake in relativity as adequately and accurately as possible. So he worked very closely with Kip Thorne to ensure that the kind of like multiverse time library is plausible in the way that it's visually portrayed. Same with the way that time operates differently on different planets when you're traveling through space and also how to skirt around a black hole without getting sucked into it. Kip Thorne also is responsible for conceiving of and helping Jonah produce the image of the black hole that appears in that film. And I think that's important to, to talk about too because the film predates the first image that we ever got of the black hole, which wasn't until 2019. Um, and we just got a really beautiful one recently too, a better one. So anyway, Kip Thorne is one of these kind of scientists that I'm hoping to highlight and bolster as is Jonah Nolan. I'm just gonna scoot to this image. This is Jonah Nolan at the first interplanetary festival. He's talking about intelligence here. And that's because he is the writer director of Westworld. So he like Asimov is thinking often about the relationship between machine and men. Um, unlike Ted Chiang, Westworld is absolutely dystopian. It's, it's, it's not a great vision, but hey, it's an exploration. So, um, Back to Kip Thorne, this is exactly what I'm looking at. Jonah is creating art. Kip is capable of expressing the science. Kip is consulting Jonah on how to artistically present that science to a lay audience. And that goes back to this interplanetary exploitation thing that we do, which is to use art to create entree to very complex theory that exists in science that people outside of science might not have access to. Um, Kip Thorne also consulted with Carl Sagan about the wormhole travel stuff in Contact. And again, with Christopher Nolan recently in the time travel movie, Tenet, which also involves portals. So, um, okay. Oh, wait, let me go back, sorry. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. Um, so now I just wanna make a case for how it is that science and literature should work together. I use the word collaboration quite a bit, but I wanna be very, very clear that I don't necessarily mean like kumbaya, hold hands collaboration. Inherent in collaboration is something like competition, discord, disagreement, and open civil discourse. So what makes science so amazing in terms of its capacity to further human understanding of the world and the universe and our place within it is that there is this regimented and rigorous method through which facts are falsified in experiment. These experiments must be repeated these experiments generate evidence that are, is analyzed and from that evidence conclusions can be drawn. And so in the great world of infinite possibilities of how the universe works, 
science is ever is every day eliminating those possibilities through a, a time tested and true method of falsification. Science is good because it's critical. Like falsification implies there in its foundation something like a counter. They are countering a presumed fact, counterfactual. And science moves forward one falsification at a time. That's extremely important. So this critical element that is like at the, at the core of what science is capable of is also shared with really great art. So art, at least the really good pieces of art, they're often critical about a particular moment in world history. It might be something in the past that's teased out contemporarily. It might be the particular moment that the artist occupies uh, or the, the way that the world is operating that's a little disappointing or um, an issue with the human condition at that moment. And then again, possibly teased out speculatively in the future. But at its core, art is also criti critical. And so the fact that science proceeds critically and skeptically by falsifying things and eliminating things, and art is moving skeptically and critically forward by inventing things, I think that these two entities only promote each other in really, really wonderful ways. They're both capable ind independently. They don't necessarily suffer in isolation, but there's so much available to the, to the uh, addition of the two. And so um, I guess if I leave you with anything, I just wanna say science is amazing, art is amazing, the two together, even more amazing. And um, at the core of that is kind of a civil, polite, but open and broad-minded discourse, which includes something like criticism and disagreement. Quite often innovations emerge out of disagreement because you bring new perspectives to things that you assumed were true the whole time. So just an open dialectic discourse between art and science is exactly what I'm aiming for. Um, okay, so I'm getting, I'm wrapping up now. I titled this talk Inter Interplanetary Poetics. Therefore, it seems like I should end with an interplanetary poem. And so I want to draw some attention to this fantastic work by Edgar Allan Poe called Eureka. It was published in 1848. And I'm going to read a couple of passages, little excerpts from its introduction. But I should probably give you a sense of what's going on in the introduction. Poe begins this book by sharing with the readers excerpts from a letter that he has in his possession. He found it in a bottle. But the letter, most curiously, was written in the year 2848. So already at the beginning of this poem, we have Poe using this time travel trope and the position of a, a critical future observer placed together just to give us a little framework for what he endeavors to do with the rest of the work, the rest of the poem. And so um, bear with me as I read these quotes. Sorry, sorry. Ugh. Okay, this is again from the author who is writing 1000 years after Poe, I should make it clear, 800 years from today. And I think it's really important to know that you'll see. Do you know, my dear friend, let me move this, that it is scarcely more than eight or 900 years ago since the metaphysicians first consented to relieve the people of the singular fancy that there exist but two practicable roads to truth. Believe it if you can. And just to clarify, the two roads that he's talking about in terms of like the scientific pursuit for truth is this Aristotelian, axiomatic, uh, deductive pursuit of, of knowledge and the Baconian colonial experimentally uh, experimental evidence kind of inductive uh, form of pursuit. So the deductive and the inductive. He's not saying that either is wrong. He's just saying that even those two together aren't complete. It's not a complete method through which one approaches truth. Now I do assure you most positively, proceeds the epistle, that I represent these matters fairly. And you can easily understand how restrictions so absurd on their very face must have operated in those days to retard the progress of true science, which makes its most important advances, as all history will show, by seemingly intuitive leaps. These ancient ideas confined investigation to crawling, but because the tortoise is sure of foot, for this reason, we must clip the wings of the eagles. He goes on. Now, my dear friend, continues the letter writer, it cannot be maintained that by the crawling system exclusively adopted, men would arrive at the maximum amount of truth, even in any long series of ages. For the repression of imagination was an evil not to be counterbalanced even by absolute certainty in the snail processes. The era of our progenitors, again, 800 years from 2848 is today, we are the progenitors. The era of our progenitors was quite analogous with that of the wiseacre who fancies he must necessarily see an object the more distinctly, the more closely he holds it to his eyes. They blinded themselves. 
And so in conclusion, I just want to demonstrate what Poe is up to here. What he wants to do is ensure that the eagles and the, and the tortoises work together. So who are the eagles? They are the generally educated men of ardent imagination, the Keplers, the Laplaces, those who speculate, those who theorize. So that sort of makes the point that I'm hoping to send you all with that uh, science is absolutely effective, uniquely so, in helping us understand what's at stake in our position in the universe. We as humans have this insatiable desire towards more knowledge. Science is very effective in furthering that knowledge. But art is too in a variety of ways. And so we cannot exclude the imagination and speculation from this sort of investigation. Uh, keep the eagles, invite the eagles, when we uh, are looking on the precipice of a, becoming a spacefaring civilization, and we think about how we want to crew our manned missions to Mars or elsewhere, please, please consider including an artist on the ship. So um, that's it. Now it's time for acknowledgments. Um, I will talk about what these images are after I've said my thank yous, but I want to first and foremost thank David Krakauer. He is the president of the Santa Fe Institute and the founder of the Interplanetary Project. It is a hugely important project, I think. And um, he was kind enough to allow me the opportunity to have a, a sense of how to direct its creation and its evolution and to put my stamp on it. It's a privilege, absolutely. It is the best job in the universe. Um, I also wanna thank Tony Egan, who has helped me all week try to organize these disparate thoughts into a hopefully logical uh, foray. <laughs> And I also want to thank Natalie Elliott for giving me some advice about keeping things short and editing. I wanted to do a lot more with this talk and it's good that I didn't. I want to thank Nick again for the invitation and the new school policy and design for outer space for including me as part of this Transceiver series. I um, really love the opportunity to discuss these big ideas on this platform and I'm, I'm really glad that I don't exist in silo thinking about this kind of forward imaginative exercise of what policy and design looks like when we do live elsewhere. Um, and lastly, I wanna thank all of you for tuning in. I hope, I hope you enjoyed what I had to say. And if you have any questions, I will attempt to address them. But lastly, let me explain these images. Uh, I've been working on the Interplanetary Project for four years. The Santa Fe Institute has been around for more than 35. And for people who know what the Santa Fe Institute is up to, and then they hear about what the Interplanetary Project is, a few of those individuals sometimes say, that's absolutely ridiculous. How, how wasteful and frivolous. That's not additive, that's distracting. How silly. Um, now, I think that those people are, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think that those people are a little short-sighted. They're the tortoises, right? They, they don't see the eagle quality that interplanetary imparts upon SFI's larger scientific mission. So these images are artifacts that exist on our campuses. The leftmost image is, a Niner Echo X-ray, it's a rocket ship that greets everyone when they come to our Cowan campus in Santa Fe. The thing in the middle is Monolith Beta. We have a Monolith Alpha and a Monolith Omega as well. They uh, exist across both campuses. They're actually slate chalkboards that pivot on a system of gears and therefore become a workspace for these, you know, diverse mind meetings about these very big problems. And uh, they are built to the specifications of the monoliths that appear in Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then to the right is 6061. It is a UFO. It is also by Bob Davis who built the rocket and it will eventually live on the Miller campus in Tosuke, our second campus. The Miller campus is named after Bill Miller who has always been a huge supporter of the Santa Fe Institute and who is our chair emeritus. But most especially, he is a supporter of very out there exploratory risky projects. And he is our biggest uh, supporter of the Interplanetary Project. The project would not exist without Bill Miller. So he gets a UFO on his campus. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, call him. Take it away. Yeah. So I thought, uh, speaking of you, though. Um, we're going to open up the Q&A to everyone. Um, so if you don't want to come on camera and talk, please feel free to throw your question in the chat. Um, if you do want to verbalize your question, you're more than welcome. Um, if you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, and also, I want to read through, I've got this message from Aram here in the chat asking about links to some examples. Um, we can definitely share some afterwards and I think some of my teammates could get something in. 
Um, and Nick, if you want to open this up while other people prepare questions, that would be fantastic. Great, thank you. And thank you again, Caitlin, for, for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the counterfactual and this the, the development of the concept that you're doing. And so you're thinking about this as you know, art, both art and science are critical and they advance by critiquing what currently exists and that in that sense, they're both counterfactual. Um, art is doing so in a sort of productive way where it's producing something different or something new um, and science is challenging what exists. And if I understood that correctly, is that, yeah, is that, that basically is, right? right? That, that is, yeah, that, that is what I said, but I do want to, I do just want to say, I, it's not as though science can't be inventive either. I'm certainly not suggesting that, but yes, it seems like science is the elimination of possibilities and art is the invention of possibilities. And that's why they deserve to be so coupled. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I was thinking about this in relation to the recent news about um, the behavior of the muon that was just announced and the challenge to the, the standard model um, that it does uh, or that it, that it puts forward. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how to apply this concept in this in that situation, like what's going on there and what work is, does the concept do? I'm certainly not going to talk about what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no way qualified to talk about what's going on. But I guess what I would say in terms of trying to reconcile with this problem that this behavior introduces is uh, this kind of reminds me, I think, about this paradigmatic shift that occurs quite often in the sciences. This is like Einstein after Newton. It's like, whoa, wait a second. The determined universe was a lot easier, like, whoa. Um, and so I think that it's important. I, I don't have a solution. I just think it's important to recognize that, you know, physics doesn't agree with itself. Scientists don't agree with themselves. Artists don't either. And so in an effort to kind of reconcile what might be going on with this weird, unpredictable thing in the muon, I think, again, it's just important that everyone who has a stake or possible uh, intuition for what might be happening be invited to the conversation and uh, contribute to the varying perspectives so that some sort of conglomerate theory might emerge. And then, of course, once we have a theory, we can begin to design experiments around it to test it and see how true or not true it turns out to be. So that's a kind of a half answer because I'm certainly not part of that conversation. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fact that I know that that happened and that you know, that implication for the standard model is about as far as I've gotten <laughs> in understanding it as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank, you, thank you. Question. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Are there others? Then, Natalie, it seems like you might have a question. I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I didn't, I, I was applauding. I know. <laughs> um, I, I, hi, how are you? I guess, actually, I guess I could ask, I do sort of have a question. I, I, I kind of want to hear more about something that I'm interested in. Um, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious about what, what you were saying with respect to the way that um, art and is kind of filled with the same kind of conflict or an analogous kind of conflict uh, at science. Um, and I, I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering um, how, like, how, do, how does that conflict show up in the collaboration between science and art? Um, I think a lot of the examples that you showed us show that the collaboration, you know, especially the artistic inspiration inspires technological innovation. Mm -hmm. But I think um, there's also a story underneath your comments about the conflict that and the sort of fire of the conflict between art and science. And I, w I just wonder if you come across in the in the interplanetary universe, yours or the one, the larger one, yeah. conflicts that seem particularly fertile. Well, so, um, oh, conflict that turns out to be fertile. Oh, that's a different, that's not where no, I, I, I mean, I was like, I can give you a bunch of examples I, I, or, of where it doesn't work. Yeah, either way, any, any of any variation, pick your part of the matrix. Well, so again, you know, conflict, I, I think is ultimately, I, I'm of the opinion that conflict can be ultimately productive. So um, I guess what I want to say is maybe in, in the answer to the question you actually asked, I could say something instead of conflict, like compromise, 
So there are artists like, let's use Interstellar as an example, who have a conception of how they want to share with the world what a black hole might look like, how it emits light, how it sucks things in. And that concept might not align exactly with how Kip Thorne, who is rewarded for his work in understanding those things, would go about illustrating it. And they two together have to come to a compromise in how to express that, one, so that it's scientifically accurate, and two, so that it's captivating to an audience that doesn't necessarily care about the accuracy, but is gained access to it by virtue of the, the art itself. So I guess that's, I don't know if that's like a perfect example, but I, I do think that something like conflict and compromise has to exist. You can't have it one way or the other and succeed in doing this important thing. Um, but then in terms of like conflict that's unsuccessful, quite often there are artists who, without collaborating directly with scientists, usurp and misrepresent things that are coming out of labs. And therefore there is a, a, a skepticism by a lot of scientists to collaborate in this art science medium at the risk of like delegitimizing the, their authority on their work at, at the risk of completely misrepresenting the work. Um, that might happen vice versa. There are very interesting artists who have devised clever experiments, but by virtue of this kind of theft that happens sometimes, they've been written off completely and therefore they don't get invitations to contribute to these conversations. So there is this actual conflict that exists, which is a, a distrust between the disciplines because you know, science has the authority of truth and art has the authority, if it does, of like expression and meaning and, and data, fact and truth and meaning aren't necessarily the same. So how do you reconcile the expression of either? Well, sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all. But when it does, it's, it's very unusually a perfect symbiosis. It is a bit of this kind of collaborative, competitive uh, compromise, I think. Does that address your question? Okay. I should say for everyone who's watching, Natalie is the other half of Atlantis. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I saw a hand from Zay before. Um, and again, if anyone else doesn't want to come on camera to speak, please feel free to throw something in the chat. Um, and I'm seeing a hand from Jenna as well. Hi, Ray, Jenna. did you have something on deck? Um, yeah, let's let Jenna go. And then uh, when the well runs dry, I'll. I'm in. Sounds good. Yes, yes. Thank you. Jenna? Hi. <laughs> um, Caitlin, great talk. I, I loved it, especially Thank the you. kiss. The kiss was the best part, but I, I <laughs> all of your thoughts on, um, you know, science proceeding counterfactually and how that, um, how that jives with the art culture as well. Um, and I wanted to actually ask if you ever make a distinction between science and technology and if you had any thoughts on how um, the culture, so, sort of the way art proceeds relates to the way technology specifically proceeds, because, you know, I think, I, I think the Silicon Valley culture that, you know, maybe produced the, the AirPod might be like different from, you know, the scientific culture, yeah, than, yeah the self-critical scientific culture, um, but maybe not, I don't know. No, I do think that there's a difference. This is kind of why I started with the technology examples and then switched to the Jules Verne example. I think the Jules Verne example is a, is a is the example of how science is motivated uh, by by fiction as opposed to how technology is invented. When I think of science, I think about this fals falsifiable, rigorous, exploratory method. The, the method of generating information that furthers human understanding, our collective human understanding of the universe and our space within it. And technology helps in that endeavor. Technology is the invention that comes out of science quite often and science fiction, as I said. But um, I think that technology is kind of beneath science um, and in service to science. I'm more interested in the practice of science as it relates to the practice of imagination uh, but again, what comes out of that are really cool devices that rule our lives and allow us to communicate in, in these really interesting ways when we have to shut ourselves up because we're afraid of getting sick. So uh, I, I do distinguish between the two. So true. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Just leaving pregnant pauses here in case anyone else wants to jump in. But we'll pass things over to Ray and hoping to hear more questions from the audience in a minute. My question is, um, you know, pertains to a line of inquiry that we at NSPDOS are very interested in, which is um, 
well, at least I personally, I especially, and the group generally, uh, there's sort of this blurry space, right, between utopia and fascism, and the question <laughs> of why so many of our imaginings end up so badly. Um, and, you know, um, I don't think I'm saying anything new in pointing out that Asimov and company um, are all, or many of the science fiction writers that gave lent their thoughts to the science world we live in now are of a type um, that is xenophobic, you know, white dudes, uh, with often connections to the military industrial complex or, mm -hmm. you know, an emerging sort of regime um, in our country that, um, you know, we are grappling with today. So, you know, assuming that uh, folks at Senfei Institute are all at least, you know, happy to nod their heads in agreement that we don't want more, you know, uh, Nazis in space, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, like, I'm wondering what that looks like in your world. You know, if there are things that you can tell us about the work that you've done, where you, um, where there are uh, spaces to sort of actively intervene or things you're on the lookout for or point us to some other resources or links or, you know, you know, other things that speak to this, this question. Yeah, um, so I feel like I can really only address what's happening in interplanetary, though I am sure that there are conversations mm -hmm. happening in our applied complexity network and in the Santa Fe science research itself, but I just think that I'm not here to um, address those or, uh, yeah, but I'll tell you what I can, but I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I feel comfortable expressing, um, at least in terms of like this dystopian existence that we see in books written by these white men, these, you know, uh, identical individuals. Um, I think it is important that we have these as monuments. We can look at them and say, look at the failings here and we can try to, uh, address what's wrong here by, um, kind of engaging with that fault and, and emerging from it. Uh, we at the Santa Fe Institute, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I was kind of not so inclusive in my presentation, but like, we really like the way that uh, authors of color and authors that are women who are not men are engaging with the faults of these by writing their own work. So of course there's Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin who are exploring different frameworks. Um, we work with an artist, we, we had a, an author, Rebecca Roanhorse recently at our Interplanetary Festival. She's an indigenous author who is exploring post-apocalyptic worlds from the Navajo perspective because the Navajos live in a post-apocalyptic world and therefore they have something to contribute to what's at stake in these explorations. And so we are inviting individuals like that to participate in conversations around world building and living documents. How, do, how does one incorporate some sort of uh, protective inclusivity in something like a constitution on a new colony. We're having these imaginative conversations and we're having them publicly as part of interplanetary. I should say that, you know, interplanetary SFI science happens for a variety of reasons behind closed doors, mostly so that individuals can share their opinions uh, privately and safely. But interplanetary is the like the largest public forum that SFI has. And we are sharing these ideas and thoughts as broadly as we possibly can, hopefully to engage with the people who would be the, like living in the consequence systems that we design in our like interplanetary existence 4,000 years in the future. So again, just constantly imagining being ever inclusive and willing to broadly and openly debate and disagree with individuals whose perspectives differ from our own because we have a long history of having not done that and, and look at the faults that we've built into these totally brittle systems as a result. Um, so I hope that's uh, at least an attempt to get to what I think is a really excellent question because if we're thinking about how we design policy, how we build for um, humanity's benefit, a future that's unlike the ones that we have that excludes all the problems we, we live with, we have to be inclusive in a way that we haven't been before. Well, I appreciate that, yeah. It sounds um, similar wheelhouses, I think. Yeah, oh, I think that, that, I think that we are best friend institutions, clearly. It seems like we're, we're thinking <laughs> in the right way. Yeah. Um, do you think that, that um, I don't know, I feel like for probably most of the people in this call, this is a given, right? Like that's part, this sort of thinking is part of what brought them to this group. So, but I'm right. wondering if, how much you see that sentiment shared in the scientific or technological communities that you rub shoulders with, um, just broadly, you know, like just sort of like a hot take, I don't know. And, and I don't want to put you on the spot or, or your group on the no, spot at all, I'm just curious. Um, I mean, it might just seem biased because I'm within it and I don't want to paint this like, you know, beautiful crystal shiny diamond uh, 
tint over the people that I work with at SFI, like SFI is amazing, but SFI is amazing. And so the people that I am rubbing shoulders with, the community of individuals that I engage with, the, the Santa Fe Institute perspective naturally includes individuals who are already thinking at this sort of uh, razor's edge between invention and, um, and experimental practice. So um, I don't think that there's enough of it in the world, but all of it that's happening, I have really proximal access to. Like I am so privileged to get to work with scientists who are settled in this kind of uh, confusion between art and science. And I mean confusion in like a really wonderful and inspiring way. So um, we see a lot of it. The interplanetary community is even more broad because it includes individuals who are creatives outside of the discipline of science. And um, therefore those individuals are already thinking about how art might influence science and the dichotomy that's ultimately productive. So I get to see a lot of it, but I have to assume that it's like all of those individuals just happen to be in my bubble and I'm very fortunate for that. But there are individuals outside of that bubble who you know, are still stakeholders for an old theory that they don't wanna test lest it prove wrong. And then suddenly they have to seek, you know, there are these architectures in scientific research that almost uh, prevent these more exploratory type possibilities. And so I, I get to work with a lot of scientists who aren't so concerned <laughs> with that, um, who are willing to be somewhat renegade in their, in their, in their pursuit of funding and in their pursuit of, of truth and who are willing to challenge their own assumptions every day. And that's amazing. Thank you. And I appreciate the point you made about using and also challenging some of the old law fiction we have in those old law imaginaries and using them as reference points to say, well, this is how it worked and maybe this is how it didn't if we right. think about it in more diverse or decolonial uh, perspectives. Um, also, just going to quickly second Amanda Fisher in the chats. Um, uh, Thumbs up for N.K. Jemison. Great imagination oh, yeah. there as well. Um, I've got Nick, and then I've got Peter. Uh, Peter can go ahead and go first since I've already had a chance to ask a question. Okay, thank you, thank you, Nick, uh, and uh, thank you, Caitlin. That was a really interesting talk, um, and it hits on a lot of uh, things I'm interested in, in regards to like hyperstitions and fictions that make themselves real. Um, I'm not going to run down that rabbit hole right now. Why not? Well, be, because be, I, I feel like running down that rabbit hole is going to get us into like the question of like the uh, t t a question of teleology, which I don't really want to go down uh, at, 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 at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, uh, but I do have a, a question that I think might be um, unfair and um, uh, a bit difficult. Um, and so I guess, so like tying in with um, your answer to uh, uh, what Ray asked, like I, I, I understand how um, SFI and th uh, the Interplanetary Project will incorporate like indigenous ontologies or other um, cosmologies into their thinking, uh, in, in, or into your thinking rather, but I guess I'm wondering like does that actually change the underlying model of thought? Like, it seems like uh, you and SFI are very indebted to the scientific model. Um, and uh, that's certainly one um, like way of viewing the world, but it's also not the only way. And it's uh, critique from indigenous perspectives from, um, from not necessarily indigenous perspectives as well. And so I'm wondering, like, why, like, it, it, it does your work necessarily reify um, that as the scientific perspective to go on, or how can, or, 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 or how do you change like your underlying scientific methodology via the incorporation of indigenous ontologies? Okay, that is a, a really challenging question. Um, let me see if I can get at the first part of it, which is. Uh, kind of endorsing and, and putting on a pedestal the scientific method as like what it is that motivates the advancement of complex system science. Um, it's kind of a tricky question. So, you know, it should be said that we don't have any labs on campus. We're not practicing this method that I discussed in my presentation. We have a broad network internationally of individuals at other institutions who do have labs, who do have teams who are working on a variety of different problems, questions, inquiries. 
And we convene these meetings to have presentations and discussions about what's at stake. And as I mentioned, you know, it is mostly scientists. I'm not going to say it's like an equal representation between imaginists and, and scientists or artists, et cetera. But um, what we do often, we, we have sort of artists in residence that sit in on these meetings and contribute. Uh, one that I, we have in Mil we have a Miller Scholarship Program, which is uh, specifically to seat fellows who exist outside of the sciences to be present at all of our meetings and contribute their opinions. It's not necessarily a native indigenous individual. It hasn't been so far at the very least, I should say. But I can give you one example was we had Neil Stevenson as a Miller scholar for quite a bit. And it's interesting to see what a speculative fiction author who also has a little bit, well, a lot of it of informational knowledge and the expertise in rocket engineering and whatnot. Um, it, it's curious to see what emerges in meetings when someone like that who exists and makes a living in speculating futures um, what that contributes. But again, that's that's how SFI operates, but we no, I, I we haven't in as much as much as we should included these sort of native cosmologies in in challenging or questioning the systems that we occupy. We are still uh, the consequence of the science path that we have depended on. And we are trying every day to break from that path and end that canalization, but it's slow going and we're we're not we haven't succeeded yet. Thank you. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah there, there, there's a lot going on. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, this uh, reminds me of the two paths of science in the poem um, that you read for us there briefly. I think that um, the question Dito's asking though, in some ways is how do we multiply those paths of knowledge? Uh, Nick? Yeah, so this is going to be a personal question in my own attempt to multiply the paths. Um, so I am, I have promised myself that I'm not going to read any nonfiction once the semester ends, and I'm just going to read fiction for the summer. Uh, and so I've got Ted Chang's uh, exhalations on my bookshelf. I've got a few other works of sci-fi and speculative fiction, and I'm wondering what are you reading? Do you see anything on the horizon that's coming out soon that you would recommend um, as things to look forward to? You've already mentioned Ken Stanley Robinson and a few other contemporary authors as well. So just curious to hear what you're, what you're looking at and looking to as sources of generation and inspiration. So I have to say that, you know, despite my interest in science fiction in this presentation that I gave, I actually have a lot of homework to do in terms of uh, navigating the science fiction canon. And so I'm not exactly looking to contemporary science fiction so much as I am hoping to give myself a, a very firm foundation in the sort of uh, in, in what in what precedes what's happening now. So um, reading Left Hand of Darkness and I'm enjoying it very much. Um, I'm also reading Ted Chiang, like I haven't finished Exhalations and I'm rereading Ted Chiang. I just reread 72 letters, which blows my mind and I highly recommend it. It's a short and sweet read. Um, and then just by virtue of the podcast, I'm rereading constantly Roadside Picnic. And that is that book just rewards rereading. It's got so much at stake in terms of hypocrisy and ethics and uh, dangers. This idea that science is authority and it's granted all of these privileges and investigation that like mavericks aren't. It's just, it's absolutely fabulous. But um, no, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm delving more into the Arthur C. Clarks and the Ursula Le Guin's and the Octavia Butler's that I don't have enough of a foundation in. So more classic stuff. But then also, you know, I'm reading Eureka. I don't know, that might actually count as one of these like forms of science fiction. I didn't say what happens after he concludes this introduction with his letters, but he essentially goes on to write a 150 page poetic cosmogony where he tries to explain how the universe functions. And by the way, he gets a lot right. He predicts black holes. He predicts the uh, the existence of multiverses. He predicts the Big Bang, like he in in 1848. And again, it's just by virtue of the fact that he gave himself the permission to explore something logically, imaginatively, the third road. So I'm reading that, and then like Lucretius. I don't know, uh, very old classic things. Uh, yeah. So I hope that's. But I recommend 72 Letters if you're if you're going into the Ted Chiang world. Reread 72 Letters. It's okay. so good. Okay, okay. And maybe I'll pull up Lucretius. <laughs> Lucretius as well. Thank you. But thank you for that question. That's a fun one. And obviously, like, I understand that there are people making suggestions in the chat. Like, I am open to anything that is outside of the canon that I've built for myself. Like, please, please give me an opportunity to engage in all of these counterfactuals. Thank you, everyone, for the questions for 
so far, and thank you, Caitlin, for the talk. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If we have anyone who hasn't spoken yet who'd like to jump up now, it's a great time for it. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, we'll let you all get on with your night. Um, give a last big thank you to Caitlin for coming out and talking with us this evening. Um, we really appreciate the engagement and we appreciate everyone here all coming out, saying a lot of thank yous in the chat as well. Um, well thank, thank you so you much for your time. So I think, yes. Um, a couple things coming up, um, as was posted in the chat before, maybe we can get that reposted. Um, next Thursday, there's an Afro-Indigenous um, Futures talk, um, speaker series with another group in the liberal studies um, here at the New School. So that will be coming up. We'd love to have everyone back for that. and. And as PDOS, New School Policy and Design for Outer Space, will be hosting some exciting things over the coming months and the summer. Lots of big plans. Can't talk about everything yet, but follow our social media, you know, follow up. Things will be coming out to you soon. So we hope to see people in the future. Yes, follow our uh, social media account. And also, if, um, if anybody would like to get involved in some more conversation, feel free to uh, message in the chat or contact us through socials because we are um, still sort of bringing in people to help us but like lead some really cool shit over the summer um, and there's just super fun conversations happening all the time so uh, yeah come by join us get weird with us and and, uh, and and productive and check out the work of the Santa Fe Institute thank you again Caitlin Santa for coming Fe out Institute. and speaking with thank us thank you tonight. Could I, could I just say one thing? Um, the, the kind of strength of the Santa Fe Institute is this bottom upness of it. If you go to the website, you find me on the website, you, you will see my email. So if anyone here wants to continue this discussion beyond this Zoom call, like please feel free to reach out and maybe suggest guests I should have on the podcast, people I should be bringing to the festival, ideas that should be explored more thoroughly than they have been in the past. Like this is an iterative, iterative process. We are brand new and growing. Interplanetary has only been around for about four years. So um, I open all suggestions. Please, please feel free to engage. Um, I really hope you will. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Have a good night. Bye. Caitlin.